Thank you so much, Gene, uh, um, and thank you also for the time we had this afternoon uh, learning a little bit about the history. And if you want to know what the transit system looked like in any year in the last century, Gene has a map. And um, <laughs> it's actually very interesting to look at those maps because you see some of the ways in which transit has actually gone in circles. Um, the way things have uh, appeared and disappeared and had to be reinvented again. Um, and again, tremendous thanks to Marilyn, who uh, not only took care of, obviously took great care of everyone else, but also took great care of me and uh, has, has done a great job organizing all of this. Um, abundant access, public transit as an instrument of freedom. This is the new working title that I've been thinking about, about sort of wh what I'm wanting to focus on now. Um, and I want to start with this idea that even if you think of yourself as a liberal Democrat, especially if you think of yourself as a liberal Democrat, let's talk about freedom and liberty and the basic sensations of liberty in a free society. Um, that's not a conservative idea. And it's actually something that's very important about what cities do, is the fostering of a certain kind of liberty. And I think we need to be able to talk about that and talk about how transit actually makes that possible. So what if transit were the logical choice? Um, there are a number of reasons to use transit that are emerging as things are changing. And I want to talk a little bit about those. Because one of the messages I want to start with is that everything is changing out there and there is no status quo. Many of our voters think that they get to choose every, that we, our choices every day are between the status quo and some kind of change. And that's not how it works. The status quo is changing. It's changing very rapidly. It's changing faster. And there's a, um, there's a good image of that. I'm sorry, I thought I had it here, but I'll just describe it to you. It's called the VMT inflection point, and you can Google this term, VMT inflection point. And it's about, and, it, and what it shows is that the overall uh, vehicle miles traveled, the overall quantity of driving in the United States, ever since World War II, has been going like this. And in 2006, it turned and started going like that. It's a very dramatic graph. You can easily find it on Google if you look for it. Whoa! In 2006, right about then, while we were busy feeling sorry for ourselves about all kinds of other things, something fundamentally crossed some sort of threshold and the role of driving, the role of cars in the US changed. And now, all of our, all of our highway advocate friends can no longer say that we need more highways because there's more driving. You may be able to say that locally, but you can't say that as a matter of national policy anymore because the growth in driving has stopped. So there's a lot that's going on there. There's something going on about urbanization itself and about more and more people choosing to live in places where they don't need to drive. But there are some other, th but, but one of the things that's important to start with as we start in thinking about transit is let's understand all of the reasons that many people already have for not wanting to drive. Because it will help get us, get us past this idea that transit has to do all the work of enticing everyone. I move more in a world where, the, where I am aware of enormous numbers of people who don't so much need enticing, they just need a basic usefulness. They're already ready. They already hate driving. They already want alternatives. And here are some of the reasons why. Affordability, um, we may actually be moving into a society where we aren't all always doing better than our parents did. And that could actually in many ways be a good thing. It makes us more frugal, it makes us more aware of efficiency. Uh, and it makes us more, affair, more aware of um, ways to create a quality of life. Um, the, um, the other thing that's happening is this, right? and this, and the fact that we now have this expectation 
this opportunity, this, this extraordinary liberty, let's call it that, to be able to be in connection with things and to interact with people and to, have, and, to, and to work on our relationships and to work on our businesses when we're doing this. And you can do this on transit. And there's a picture of a transit vehicle where everybody is doing that. And that is what the subways of New York look like now. And you can't do that when you're driving. And so driving is now suddenly, compared to this, it is like an hour of dead time in your day. You'd better really like what's on the radio. Because, and here's the other thing that's coming at us, we're getting lots of new statistics about distracted driving. We're getting lots of new statistics about how dangerous it actually is to do really much of anything when you're driving except stare at that dreary expanse of asphalt. You can listen to the radio, you can have a conversation with the person in the seat next to you as long as you don't actually turn and look at them, but that's really about all you should do. And, and we understand that the statistics, the, the studies are coming back now saying it's not just a matter of taking your eyes off the road, it's taking your mind off the road that is the danger. And I am very much aware of this. And one of the reasons that I hate driving and always have is that I would like to be able to go somewhere with a friend without feeling like his life is in my hands. I don't actually want to have, the, have in my hands the capacity to kill everybody that I'm traveling with. I don't find that relaxing. <laughs> Apparently there are people who do. <laughs> so, so this is all converging and there are lots of good reasons not to drive anymore. And even if there weren't all of those reasons, there, are, there is the emerging popularity of places where people don't want, to, where not driving is an important part of how everything works. People are figuring this thing out. Now, we're all generalizing about the millennials, but so let me say some very concrete things. Because one of the things that happens when you talk about the millennials is that lots of people think, oh yeah, I was like that, my, my 20 year old kid, yeah, he's like that, but yeah, I, like, I liked those things when I was his age. So you have to talk about thing, ways that you're, you, you have to really remind people that their ch adult children are not just like them, only younger. Because I think all parents secretly want to believe that they are. Um, the, um, so one of the things that's happening is that the age of the first driver's license is continuing to rise, it's now about 19. It continues to rise very slowly, the age at which people get their first driver's license in this country. And there's been a lot of research done about this. And this has to do with the fact that, first of all, there's already been enough urbanization that a lot of young people are now living in cities uh, or even have had the opportunity as adolescents to live in places where they don't need cars as badly. But what's more, even when they have that option, they would rather be doing this and then, then driving a car. Um, and so they're just less interested. Um, so there are all these other concerns, but then there's this other extraordinary attraction to the multimodal city, to the diversity, proximity, opportunity, and serendipity that arise from living in a place where lots of different things are going around you and lots of things are very close. Finally, of course, losing the car is a key to affordability. And this is one of the kings that I think is very important for um, when we think about how uh, transit relates uh, to low income people in particular, is that first of all, I don't, want there, I don't want to think about a class of low income people. I want to think about people who are at various points on the income spectrum and who are we hope moving along the income spectrum. Um, and losing the car can be a key way to move along the income spectrum for yourself or for your family. You're a low-income family, your kid is turning 16. Do you buy him a car or do you save to send him to college? Which is gonna be bad. So one of the things that's not helpful to us is binary thinking. Now I'm gonna step back and put on my Stanford Humanities hat here. And I'm gonna point out that one of the things that literature scholars know and one of the reasons why you should hire literature students or at least listen to them <coughs> is that they are very attuned to what's going on in words. And your language, the way our language is structured, gives us this perpetual illusion of things being divided into two groups. So think about the word tall. That's a nice example because 
actually, when you stop and think about it, there is not a category of tall people. There is only a category of taller people. You can say I'm tall. What you really mean is I'm taller than you, or I'm taller than most people. There's no category of tall people. Likewise, there is no category of low-income people. Right? There is no class of low-income people. There are people in various situations along a spectrum of incomes, just as the way they're along a spectrum of heights. And breaking out of that model is very important. So when the, but the thing is, the language will give you the illusion. It is so easy to say low-income person, rich person. It is so easy to, to create, to use these category words and to think we are talking about a group of people and that they're all more or less like each other and that they're all more or less in the category. And I have great sympathy for the elected officials in the room. I've never met an elected official who can get through a day without doing this a little bit. It's part of how you organize your basic sense of what a constituency is and who seems to want what. But it's wrong. <laughs> Because whenever we have these two, these, whenever we're being in, invited to divide things into two, usually what, actu what there actually is is a spectrum of possibility between them. And this is so, and, and this is very important because many of my friends who have PhDs in engineering didn't get this because they didn't have that mandatory humanities course or they didn't somehow, I mean, we, we don't properly teach linguistics for engineers. But one of the things that you encounter in, the, in a lot of what appears to be technical professional work is this distinction between a so-called choice writer and a so-called captive or dependent writer. Um, transportation planners, believe it or not, when, they th in their, when they're all by themselves among transportation planners, they think there's nobody look else listening. They actually use this word, captive. Captive writers. You're our prisoners. We have you in the dungeon. Um, and the real and and so the, and you'll I'll pick up reports. And I'll say, oh, our, our writers are about you know our writers are about seventy percent captive. No, they're not. <laughs> Everybody is making choices in the context of their situation, and the and the idea of there being a choice writer or a captive writer is simply ends of a spectrum, and everybody is in the middle. And that is very important point. For this is why. Because I've already heard things said in this city, as I hear said in other cities, that imply that we need a transit system that attracts choice riders and that there's something else for those low-income riders. And I've even heard uh, no one who was in a meeting, but I've heard a report in me saying class, um, suggestions that it's somehow a problem if those two groups mix. And that's. And, and honestly, I encounter that more in the Deep South than I encounter it here. I encounter it less on the West Coast than I encounter it here. But that's something we really have to confront because it's a fundamentally suburban idea that we can organize our lives so that we only meet people like us. It's one of the things that early suburbia was able to deliver on. It's not what, it has never been the proposition of urban life. That has never been what cities are about. Cities are about encountering difference. What are people choosing? What are people who create economic value choosing? Ask Google. Google thought they were doing the right thing by building a manicured, beautiful, luxurious, um, uh, serene campus out in the suburbs of the Bay Area with wonderful jogging trails and the gymnasiums and the free smoothies and everything else. And then they discovered and surrounded by lots and lots of, of nice sound walled subdivisions where the, where the um, elite couldn't afford homes. And then they discovered that their most creative people, the people who were creating the greatest value for them, all wanted to live in San Francisco, <laughs> where they step over homeless people to get into the seedy jazz nightclub where they have their best ideas. And so this idea that separation and isolation is the key to any sort of economic success is simply not the proposition of the city, and it is not what the market is moving toward now. The market is moving toward, I mean, you know, the, 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 you know, the Google talent that is insisting on living in San Francisco, and, and the, the, the code of that story, of course, is therefore Google needs to spend a fortune on express buses 
that they have to run to bring their geeks 35 miles from, to, from between you know, what they, where they thought they would live and where they insist on living. Because it is so important to those people to be confronted with diversity every day. And that includes diversity of income. So the important thing about this idea of the, of, of, of the choice captive being a spectrum is that it changes our notions about what we're trying to do with transit. And um, I have heard, and this is an interesting thing, because the notion that it's two boxes is something that I hear from both ends, right? So the notion that low-income people are a category is something I hear both from very wealthy people and from low-income people. But the reality of the spectrum is that everybody's situation is different. And that difference between people's situations is actually incredibly important to transit because transit succeeds in the middle of this spectrum. Transit does not succeed. Uh, I mean, I have met elite people who are quite clear with me that they will never ride a bus. And I say, OK, that's fine. You're, congratulations, you're part of the elite. There aren't very many of you. It doesn't really matter <laughs> if you wouldn't ride a bus. Because in the sustainable, you, there, there are so few of you, top 1%, that we can have a sustainable utopia and you can still drive your BMW. This is how Germany works, right? Germany makes incredibly lux incredible luxurious cars and they have freeways with no speed limits where you can push these cars to the ecstatic edge. And meanwhile, the other 90% of the population is living in incredibly sustainable and wonderful livable cities. And it all works. We don't need the top one, even the top 10% to want to ride successful transit. So successful transit is about the middle 80%. And successful transit succeeds, first of all, among the people who are comfortable with that diversity. It succeeds with the, among the people, you know, um, you know, the successful people who ride transit in a place like Portland, and lots of them do, don't have a problem with sitting next to the guy who washes dishes in, the, in his favorite restaurant. That's not a problem. That's actually part of what you expect in a big city. Um, and then the next generation is, is choosing to own fewer cars. Are they choice or captive? You know, I chose not to own a car. Does that make me a choice rider or a captive rider? This whole concept, this whole desire to sort people out socioeconomically, which we all have, is the death of transit, especially if we allow ourselves to start designing transit systems around specific classes. It's the death of transit. And no great transit system works that way. So this comes very much to the way a lot of us think about technologies. And I want to emphasize, I don't have an opinion about, um, I'm not here to tell you that you should or shouldn't have built a streetcar. You've built a streetcar. That's great. We're moving forward with that. But we are going to continue to have conversations about what rail actually means and about what different kinds of technologies actually mean and what it means to get excited about a particular technology. And so there's this interesting question of, um, of am I a streetcar person because I'm on a streetcar? If I get on a streetcar in Melbourne, Australia, what's on the wall is a map of just the streetcar network. And the assumption of not, not all the buses that connect with it. And the assumption of that is because I'm on a streetcar, I'm a streetcar person, that I'm interested in streetcars because I'm riding the streetcar. It's actually possible that I'm not interested in streetcars, but that this streetcar is going where I'm going, and that I don't actually care. <laughs> what the technology is under the floor. I may care more about things like speed and frequency and reliability that determine whether, whether this thing actually gets me where I'm going. And so maybe this is the map that matters. And this is the route into what I want to call abundant access. So um, this little diagram, which is, was done by a company called Conveil, and which I would like to see attached to every real estate listing everywhere, is a simple drawing of you plunk your, your, your uh, pointer down on a map. This is, this is my hometown, Portland, Oregon. And you get these blobs. The technical word for them is isochrones. The blob is how far you can get, where you can get exactly, with transit plus walking in a given amount of time. And, you can, and so the blue blob is 15 minutes. That's sort of your errand or, or go to lunch or spontaneous travel sort of distance. The green blob is 30 minutes. That's the distance most people, uh, that's the time most people are willing to commute. That's kind of a commute shed. 
The 45 minute blob, the pink, that's maybe the trip you make once or twice a week. You know, it's maybe okay for your mother to live that far, for your elderly mother to live that far away. It's probably not okay for you to be that far away from your job. The point is, this enables people to take responsibility for the, for the consequences of their own location choice. And, but the other thing this does is to turn around, is to present what transit does, what all transportation services do really, in a different way than we usually talk about them. We usually talk about ridership predictions. We talk about development outcomes. We still haven't talked about anything that actually is, has anything to do with why anyone would ride it yet. So then we talk about, um, if we talk about a single service outcome, we probably talk about speed first, in-vehicle travel time. Um, but that's only useful if you're going when the thing is going and it's going where you're going and you want to go there. This map is simply travel time turned inside out. And very importantly, it includes waiting time. Because as we know in the transit business, and if you don't know this, you'll discover it pretty quickly as you start using transit, waiting time frequently overwhelms in vehicle travel time. It is, frequent, it is the frequency rather than the speed that often matters. So you can move your pointer around and you can take responsibility. I, I'm about to, I'm thinking about relocating my office pretty soon and I could locate my office in downtown Portland and those are all the places that, that my employees could get to me easily from. Or I could spend a lot less to be sort of out in the inner city grid and those would be my options. Or I could spend even less and be in a, in a suburban business park and that's where people would be able to get to me easily on transit and I can take responsibility for that. But this also raises the question, here's a new way to think about what we might be trying to do with transit. What if we were trying to grow these blobs? What if we were trying to expand the area that people can get to readily uh, in a reasonable amount of time for the most people overall? What if we were trying to do that? Well, here's the interesting thing about it. Um, when you start asking this question, what percentage of the city's jobs, nightclubs, shops, parks, potential friends can I get to in 15 or 30 minutes? We're not talking about transportation anymore. We're talking about the essence of urban liberty. Because what we're talking about is how much of the city is available to me. If your city is not readily available to you, you might as well live in Ajo, right? <laughs> the reason you live in Tucson is that there is a lot more going on and you have a lot more options and you have a lot more choices because you live in a place where there is, where there is stuff happening, but you have to be able to get to that stuff or you might as well be in a rural village, right? And so your freedom as an urban resident has so much to do with just the city being available. So what, here's what I mean by abundant access. I mean as many people as possible, able to reach as many destinations as possible as quickly as possible, but not just for that purpose. That's just transportation play. No, so that they have as many real choices and opportunities as possible in their lives and are therefore free and I am intentionally using the word free in exactly what conservatives mean by it and exactly what the Declaration of Independence means by it and exactly what we mean by it when we use that word in America. But that's what that, this is what that is for an urban resident. This is access to your city, which is your freedom. Now, total abundant access is multimodal, so this is a very important thing. I want to encourage us not to feel, if we're here as urban transit advocates, some sort of generalized disapproval for people who live in suburban and rural environments where they rely on cars. Um, the reality is that where you live is going to overwhelmingly determine what's going to seem logical for you in terms of transportation. And there's no point in arguing with that. There's no point in telling people that their experience, that, you know, their experience is wrong. Everybody believes in what they've learned from their own experience. It's completely logical that if you live in a sound wall subdivision 15 miles east of here, you're going to view your car as pretty essential. And so we have to talk about this in a way that is not implying that everybody should be on transit. In fact, when you want, if you want transit to achieve very high ridership, and this is one of the most interesting questions you have to think about, if you asked me to design a purely high ridership transit network for Tucson, it would be smaller in geographic area than your current network. 
because, there are, because your transit system currently goes to many places where high ridership is not, a, is not a possible outcome because the land use pattern is just too unfriendly to it. We know what generates ridership. It's high frequency service serving patterns of density, walkability, contiguity, linearity, which means that transit can run in straight lines. It doesn't have to thread through labyrinths. And overwhelmingly, it's density and walkability. And so transit can't be equitable in the sense that most people think of like libraries as being equitable. It's going to have, you know, to, to the extent that you want ridership out, out of it, it's going to have to be able to choose its market and focus on where it can succeed. So transit's success is unavoidably connected to a particularly urban lifestyle and a particularly urban choice that is going to be more relevant to some neighborhoods than others. So I want to get back to this question of technology. What's abundant access made of? Well, it's made of walking and sometimes cycling, plus a network of routes and lines designed to optimize these six variables. I'm not going to go through them in detail. But I, you, know, I, you can read my book and talk about how all these variables fit together to create the largest possible blobs for the, large, for the most people. Does technology matter? It seems to matter. It matters in certain ways around the extremes. If you're actually trying to deliver abundant access, um, there, are some, there is, of course, the extreme of driverless rapid transit, which is a very efficient way of delivering frequency and span, because uh, um, the cost of transit is otherwise driven by the cost of labor. There's also an excellent reason to build rail, which is that you need a high number of passengers per driver. Again, please remember that if we have employees on the vehicle, the, the cost of that employee is the dominant cost of operating transit. So it's not, that's why like smaller buses aren't cheaper than big buses. I can't chop a big bus in half and have two small buses. Not how it works. Uh, it's the cost of the driver that really determines it. And so if you can carry, you know, where you need to carry 300 people per driver like that Swiss tram does, or if you need to carry 1,000 people per driver like BART does under San Francisco Bay, then you definitely need rail. But some of the things that people most commonly associate with rail are speed and reliability. And these actually have nothing to do with whether you're on rails or tires. Speed and reliability in transit are about how long you spend stopped and about what can get in your way. And we have enough experience now, and it's actually logical if you stop to think about it. Buses and rail vehicles can all go as fast as it's safe to go in an urban setting. What, what determines speed and reliability is the delay that they encounter along the way. And by and large, if you're in an exclusive lane, you're not going to encounter delay. If you're not in an exclusive lane, if you're mixed with traffic, you are going to encounter delay. And, that real, and the bus rail distinction really doesn't enter into it. In fact, one of the critiques of streetcars is that if you're going to be in mixed traffic, you, you will be more reliable if you can maneuver around little obstacles that arise. And obviously, that is the bus's one advantage over the streetcar in that environment. That's why, um, you know, so that's part of the whole conversation around that. But let's come back to this issue of frequency. Because of all those things that are important to, um, to what makes transit succeed, frequency, and to some extent span also, by which I mean duration, how long it runs, we have a particular problem with frequency, which is that only we transit people understand it. Um, and, and also, we can't take a picture of it, and we can't draw a map of it. Well, we can draw a map of it. I'll show you one. But you have to really intend to do that and stop and think about it. And so we have this problem that something that we all know is incredibly fundamental is hard to talk about. Um, then there's the reality that we are taught that we need to build a consensus among people who are themselves right now, like it or not, mostly motorists and whose sense of how things work, and everyone's sense of how things work, is conditioned by how they get around. And, and when I'm talking to a motorist, especially you know, a well-intentioned motorist who really wants transit to succeed, but who just doesn't use transit themselves, I have to say things like, imagine there's a gate at the end of your driveway that only opens once an hour. OK, that's what frequency is. That's what waiting is. That's what low frequency service is. And if you're just looking at lines on a map, and you're not understanding that this line means a service coming every 10 minutes, and that line means a bus every Tuesday afternoon, you have no idea what you're looking at. You can't begin to understand what you're looking at. And so what part of my quit presenting elected officials and decision makers and the media with maps that don't make this really clear. Because if you don't know what the frequencies are, you don't understand the network. 
If you don't understand, if you don't know what the frequencies are, you don't know whether it is a network because you don't know whether the routes can even work together, which is the first step toward a bunch of routes becoming a network, right? So I've been working for the last 10 years on banging the table about frequent network branding. And we've had project process and progress in a lot of cities now. Go into any of the Los Angeles rail stations and you'll see that diagram every 15 minutes or less. Here's the network for people in a hurry. What if we, what if we focus not on rich people or poor people or black people or whatever sort of, the sort of demographic we're worried about? What if we were interested in the class of people in a hurry? <laughs> people who don't have a lot of time. Well, you know what's interesting? This is very unifying, and it's very unifying across the income spectrum because I know a fair number of low-income people. In fact, there's a whole low-income wing of my family, and they are all incredibly busy, right? You have a, you have a half-time job here. You have a half-time job over there. You're taking a class in the evening. You're getting the kid from daycare. It's a whole bunch of little trips around all day, and it's very, very hard and viable Frequent, especially transit, frequent, 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 they don't have time to wait, um, makes all the difference. <clears throat> and so you'll start seeing people locating along those lines just in response to frequent service. Now, and, and where you've got good housing policies, you know, as we do in Portland, we encourage affordable housing, we encourage senior facilities, all those things to be on the frequent network because we don't want to have the problem of the senior housing development that's in a freaking mobile home park out on the end of a rural road and they expect transit service. And I'm sorry, it's just too far and there aren't enough of you. You don't want to create that problem to begin with. So this is happening in a lot of places. This is, uh, this is one example of what I'd call a pretty world-class frequency map. This is the, the, the transit map of Washington, D.C. Um, just to, to savor how bad transit maps can be, the map that they used to have in this city was color-coded according to whether the routes ran into Maryland or into Virginia. That was the most important distinction. And so, and, or whether they stayed in the district. And so I looked at the map and like the district's all one color and Virginia's in the color and Maryland's not this. I, I didn't need you to tell me that. I can see that the map goes into the Virginia. Tell me something I don't know that's important like, is this coming anytime soon? Is this remotely useful, right? Well, they did that on this map. The black lines are the subway system. The red lines are the frequent buses. And you can see from the back of the room exactly what the frequent bus network looks like. And, how, and, and you can also see things like, does it hook together or not? Does it connect with itself? Are there lots of opportunities to connect within it? So we weren't actually asked to do this. But when I come to a new city and nobody has drawn a frequent network map, I draw it. Because I can't tell what I'm looking at until I draw this. And so we drew it. So here's what it looks like. In a hurry, this is where you can travel in Tucson without having, waiting to, having to wait more than 15 minutes all day. Suntran, you don't have to pay graphic artists to make this map. You can have it. <laughs> and it's accurate, and it's ready to go. Think about what this map says. This map says transit is interested in being useful to people in a hurry. Transit is, and, and Understandable, yes, it's buses on streets, it's bus shelters, it's hot, you have to walk. All those things about transit are still there, but there are enough people in the middle who have a reason to want to try transit if we just show them where transit can be useful. And that's what this map is trying to do. So remember, I, sh I mentioned on the, on the DC map just now, the, the other thing you can see is how well connected it is to itself, how easy it is in that network. The red lines tend to connect to each other. They connect to the black lines. You can see how you would use lines in combination to get lots of places. Um, well, Tucson's a lot smaller than DC, but let's start with what's working here, OK? Let's start by celebrating what's working. With Alvernon, and the, th and the north, south, 16, and the three big east-west corridors, Speedway, Broadway, and 22nd, you have the beginnings of something called a high-frequency grid. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But the beauty of a high-frequency grid is generally that you've got frequent routes going this way, frequent routes going this way. And with, a, with one frequent transfer, you can get almost anywhere, from almost anywhere. You have the rudiments of that, and the success of the Alvernon corridor, which is the first high-frequency line that does not go downtown, is the first step into 
a, a, a citywide frequent network that still converges on downtown, but that's also has a strong grid element to it. Good design you know, marries those two impulses. The other thing about drawing this map is that only when you draw this map do people start asking you for more frequent network. You have to tell them, you have to show them what they want before they ask you for it. And this is a big problem because when we show the public only maps of where some transit route goes and makes them all look equally important, the comments we get back are, why don't you drive further in, out into the desert to me, you know, to, the, to, the, to these four mobile homes? And, no, and nobody says, wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture is if I, I'm at the University of Arizona and I want to go out 22nd, what do I do? Okay, so you look at that, you think about the grid principle and you immediately see there's a gap on Campbell and that that gap on Campbell is a kind of bigger deal than introducing new corridors, good as that would be, because we have a frequent corridor that isn't complete, that, doesn't, that, that starts to take you to opportunities, but in the, it only takes you to the connection on Speedway. It doesn't take you to all the places you could get to if it also got to Broadway or 22nd. But yes, we are talking about buses, buses and rail working together. So what happens when somebody says, but I simply wouldn't ride a bus? Um, and the answer to that has to be, is your dislike of buses worth shrinking the range of your freedom? So one of the problems we have, and I spend a lot of time with elite architects, the new urbanist crowd, a lot of these folks um, love them, love what they do, but they're in the position they work in a, in a space in which they imagine that everybody is going around making all of their judgments on purely aesthetic terms, okay? They're assuming, they're imagining a world in which somebody chooses whether to ride a streetcar or a bus or not to ride transit at all and, and, and are imagining a situation in which the aesthetic trade-off is the important trade-off, more important than like, would you like a large range of freedom? And I, had, I ran into the CEO of Alaska Airlines at an event recently, and, it was, and he, he knew it, he heard what I did, and he immediately said, so what's the future? It's all about rail, isn't it? And I said, so what's the future of your business? It's all about the A380, right? It's all about, it's all about big planes. We all know that nobody likes to ride regional jets. Okay, but regional jets are like buses. They have a really important purpose. There are lots of places. If, if, if I can say I would never ride a regional jet and I will never be able to go to a lot of places. So is your dislike of buses worth shrinking your range of freedom when you put it that way and when you also draw that map that shows people where they can get to easily and how to do it on a frequent network, this whole question starts to change. Be prepared then to challenge some of these assumptions. The assumption that rail is permanent and that buses are flexible. Um, I, um, there are senses in which that's true. There are senses in which that's false. The terms permanent and flexible are very tricky. Here's one example. A um, hundred years ago, there were lots of streetcars. Most of them disappeared. The rails in the street didn't make them permanent, did they? Well, except an extent they did, because there are mostly bus lines still running there. So if, there's, if there was a permanent market, the service was permanent and continues to be. Real permanence lies in the permanence of the market. If you're concerned about whether your bus route will disappear, don't just take the attitude that, oh, it's a bus route, the transit agent you could change it tomorrow. Ask what the productivity of that bus route is. If it's a high-performing bus route, it is not going to change. If it's a low-performing bus route, it is more likely to. There are th and, and ultimately, the streetcar is nothing but a manifestation of, yes, this was a particularly high-performing cord. Be prepared to challenge the assumption that there are bus people and then there are rail people, which is very much like saying that there are choice riders and captive riders. And be very suspicious of the claim that buses don't stimulate development, but rail does. That is a very much a big end of town, very large numbers kind of concept of what stimulating development means. If you put out that frequent network map that I just showed you, and people 
just make logical choices when they move about where to locate if they care about frequency. And I mean the choices that low income people make especially. Please don't think of low income people as people without choices. They're making choices in the context of a different set of conditions, but their choices are incredibly impactful. And when we call them, and when we treat them as though they are dependent and don't have choices, we fail to see the incredible opportunity. Right? That's really important. When you see somebody waiting in a bus shelter in a situation where you think you wouldn't be willing to wait in that bus shelter, there are two ways you can react to that. Oh, that poor person who has to use the bus, or oh, that pioneer of our future transit system. Right? Because the thing about that spectrum is that, of course, People who have a stronger disincentive to driving and income is a, good, is a good reason to want to not drive are going to try it first. But they're not all down here in a box of people who are stuck there. They're all along the spectrum. And the attractiveness of transit will grow along the spectrum toward the point where it's useful to you, wherever you are. But that's because as more people use it, it gets better, it gets better. More people who are in somewhat more fortunate positions use it, and that means it's finally gotten good enough that you find it useful. The low-income people pioneered and drove that vector to the point where transit became useful to you. That's what I mean by that. So be very, and, I, and I'm saying this to the, to, the, to the BRU folks in the room as well, be very careful about the notion that you're just sticking up for yourselves and based on your needs. Actually, you need respect as leaders, okay? Um, and so this thing about buses don't stimulate development, if you show a useful bus system, of course people locate in response to it. And of course that, that is creating the real estate market. That's what the real estate market is. And of course, it may be buses don't stimulate high-end development. Maybe you know, buses may be more likely to stimulate affordable apartments. Well, that's fine. That's development. That's an important part of the economy. Um, and finally, of course, when, you, when your inner city really does take off, as it has in Portland, where I live, we have all kinds of redevelopment going along on our frequent bus lines. We have all kinds of development policies, and now we're talking pretty high-end development, where we permit lower levels of parking because we're on a frequent bus line and we know that lots of people will use it. And all, and so uh, if, you, if you think that the only transit-oriented development is rail-oriented development, that's probably just because that's how someone's using the term transit-oriented development. Everything that gets built on a high-frequency transit line is transitory development if it is going to, if, if the service, that mobility, the access, the freedom is part of the proposition of living in that place. Um, to my rail friends, I tend to, I tend to emphasize over and over that um, rail has a few particular needs and, a partic and particular uh, issues. It's one feature of rail lines is that when you get to the end of them, you have to get off. And as a result, uh, this is not true of bus rapid transit corridors, where the bus can keep going off the end of the infrastructure. And this is actually very important. And it's one of the reasons why your starter streetcar line makes a lot of sense, because it connects two really big dots. And there are lots of people going to both ends of the line. There are lots of people going to everywhere in between it. Makes good sense. As you head out east across the grid, you encounter a different situation, which is markets that just gradually peter out. And there isn't a single strong destination out there that you can focus on the way you can focus on the University of Arizona. That's a reason to be a little suspicious of rail. The other thing, the thing I'm always saying to my rail friends is that rail succeeds in the context of a robust frequent bus network. Our first light rail line in Portland was preceded uh, by first by a, uh, uh, four years before that light rail line opened, but in anticipation of it, we put in our urban high frequency grid of buses and we developed a bus line that pretty much did what, did what rail would then do. And we let the bus line build the market toward the rail line. The rail line would not have succeeded without all those intersecting bus services, which brought people to the rail stations from all those neighborhoods. And finally, that rail so often grows out of successful bus lines, which is why if you want to see rail in a corridor, it's not the end of the world if we build bus rapid transit to start. <laughs> Um, the philosopher Alan Watts, in his book, The Wisdom of Insecurity, made the comment 
that Western cultures are prone to eat the wrapper and throw away the food. Eat the wrapper and throw away the food. And I think about this when I'm looking, for example, at a display of protein bars on a shelf. <laughs> and I notice that the thing I want is completely concealed by symbols of the thing I want. And I'm, I can only choose among the symbols because I can't see the thing I want. In fact, in many cases, the thing I want is concealed by a photograph of the thing I want. And what he's getting at there is that we are a symbol-loving culture and that we spend every day bombarded with symbolic, with, with, with symbolic representations of our desires, symbols of the thing we want, and we are sold those symbols. Symbols of prosperity, symbols of success, symbols of sex, symbols of whatever we want. Symbols of freedom. Cars are excellent symbols of freedom. They are an incredibly effective symbol of freedom. In certain circumstances, they are good providers of freedom, but in other circumstances, they are not. So I just want to end with the idea that the vehicle, the technology, is the wrap. And that this, your freedom to access your city, is the food. So we have actually, uh, this event technically goes until 8 o'clock. You're free to drift away whenever you need to drift away. But a microphone's being brought forward so we can have a little bit of discussion. Um, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, this is, by the way, if you need to leave, a good time to leave while we're sort of in transition. And if you need to ask a question or make a comment, the microphone is live here. So you're asked to just come up to the microphone. And uh, we'll have a conversation here. And, and, um, uh, see where, and see where we can go. And there's always a little, well, I'll add a, have a couple of minutes here, and I'll take a drink of water while people who are slipping need to go do so. We don't have to go until 8 o'clock either. We'll go as long as we want. Someone has to start. <laughs> um, in those uh, isochrome, is that the word? Isochrome. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the choices people are making based on frequency, that makes complete sense. Uh, what about price? Mm -hmm. That's my question. What about price? What about price? So. Um, Let's start with the understanding that in the larger scheme of pricing, the game is completely rigged. Um, transit agencies are not profitable, but then neither is road construction and maintenance. And so we are uh, trans anyone who is expecting transit to focus primarily on revenue outcomes is expecting somebody to act like a business when they are competing with an entirely socialist enterprise, namely the way we build and manage roads by and large. And so this is pretty well documented and well understood. And our friends in the car lobby will say, but we have a gas tax, we pay for all that. No, at best you pay for, the, for the, what are only the most direct costs. You never pay for the indirect costs. You never pay for your contribution to air pollution or climate change, or uh, you never pay for the true market value of the 100 square feet of expensive real estate that you take up every time you park your car for free. When you shop at, you know, when you take transit to the mall, you, well, the price of the things you buy includes the cost of the parking, of, of the free parking for everybody who drove. So let's not even pretend that there's any sort of fairness to that. <laughs> Nevertheless, Transit has to, has to generate some revenue from its riders. Um, and that whole, um, and, and so let me, let me raise this about fare. Because it's one of the most difficult issues when we're thinking about this income spectrum. Because what we tend to hear from our low income riders and our low income advocates 
is that the most important thing is the fare. Whatever you do, don't raise the fare. Well, as long as we're in a world where the fare we charge affects the quality of the service that we can provide, never raising the fare is a real limitation on the ability to ever improve the service. And that tends to mean, and so an extremely low fare transit system tends not to be able to improve in the ways that broaden its constituency so that more and more people care about it. And in my experience, the worst possible thing for a low-income person is to be on a transit system that only low-income people ride, because not enough people will care about that system. And so we have to be able to raise fares. We have to be able to do that in order to grow the market. And um, let me tell you how, how the British and Australians do this. They have so much, there are lots of things about them that are not to be envied, but this is one. <laughs> Their idea is that transit agencies should run transit systems and that redistributionist policies or policies that are fundamentally about putting a layer of support under low-income people are the responsibility of the Health and Human Services Department. And what that means is that the transit agency sets the fares and the social service agencies provide fair subsidies to low-income people based on their needs. This is beautiful because then you're no longer trying to achieve to solve the problem of income inequality out of the transit agency's budget, which it really doesn't, is, which is really a lot to ask a transit agency to do, you know? They're trying to run a transit system. Um, and so, unfortunately, we're coming out of a history, right, where, the where in most meetings of government agencies, when they get together, the transit agency is the most unimportant person in the room. And when you get a bunch of, of, of power figures, I've been in this room many times, if you get a bunch of power figures around a table representing different agencies, they will all agree that the most unimportant per, uh, agency in the room should solve everyone else's problems on their budget. That's always how that works. And so the transit agency is expected, you know, has this tiny budget, is trying to run a transit system, and is all, also expected to somehow meet the social justice needs of low-income people out of that budget. That is a colossal task to ask the transit agency to do. And it ultimately, and so that does tend to have to be rethought. How we think about why we provide discounts to low-income people in whatever ways that we do. Um, but but, but if, you, if, you expect an, if you expect the fare to be frozen forever, we're not gonna be able to grow things. And we're not going to be able to grow services in the way that bring more people on them. And therefore, this is the important thing for learning people, make more people care. And therefore, generate more support and so that transit continues to grow. That, in my experience, is the problem. We've been told that um, when discussing transit mo uh, nodes, mm -hmm. that the average person will walk about a quarter of a mile. I happen to live at Alvernon and Broadway, and I'll, I walk much further. I'll walk to the grocery store, or, right. or all around. What, what's the, how important is looking at that? Is, that? is that fast and true in terms of ridership and getting to these nodes? Uh, is there ways to expand that? You know the thing about these isochrones? is that they actually, is that when you start looking at it this way, and you imagine that what people really want is simply to be able to get as, to as many interesting places as possible as quickly as possible, maybe the answer to that question is people will walk as far as it's logical to walk in order to do that. In other words, you start thinking about it this way, and you don't need a maximum guideline. You don't need to have an answer. I don't think there is an answer to the question of how far will people walk, because I don't think people frame the question that way. So, I mean, the first answer, the first thing we observe in response to that question is that, yes, lots of people are comfortable walking about a quarter mile to transit, but if the transit is more useful, if it's rapid transit, if it's, um, you know, B BRT or uh, light rail or whatever, if it's fast and reliable, people walk further to it. That's just because the more useful a service is, the further it's logical to walk to it in the context of what is still overall your fastest trip. Um, 
This will happen sometimes if you go into, and, and a trip planner, if you, well, a good trip planner will tell you to do this. It, you, know, you can tell it, I don't want more than two blocks, and it'll take that constraint and shrink your blocks. But, but if, you're will, if you want a, the maximum range of, of destinations, the answer is often to walk quite a long distance to a really good service. In fact, you may actually live on an infrequent line and if you actually want to get where you're going, the answer is frequently to ignore that line and walk some distance over to the frequent line. Um, a, a good trip planner will tell you that that's actually the rational thing to do. So I'm opposed to all of those kinds of guidelines and rules of thumb if what they're doing is obscuring the notion that maybe people are just doing what's logical. And, I, and while lots of people have lectured me over the years about how irrational people are, and it's not like I don't know that, fundamentally, we are in the presence of good information, which is the thing we have mostly been lacking, capable of making reasonably clear decisions about what's the best way to do things. Oh, and in case anyone is thinking, but it's hot in Tucson. January, I was in Edmonton. We had the same conversation uh, about Edmonton in January. Uh, I hear this everywhere. Human beings are incredibly resilient. <laughs> they put up with unpractice with all kinds of things that they think they would not put up with. And fundamentally, when we study walking distance across different climates, the climate matters remarkably little because people have adapted to wherever they are. And if you live in Edmonton, walking in negative 20 and a, and a meter of snow is just a normal part of life. Hi, could you put the Tucson map that you created? Oh, I'll show you back to that. There it is. A little while ago, we went through the process of the general plan, and I took part as a volunteer. And in fact, looking at the corridors, the Broadway and the Speedway were something that we talked about. But what you haven't talked about is if we want to increase, especially those two, how do we achieve, especially in terms of city council and major decisions. I'm a city planner, no, is this, unfortunately not with the city of Tucson, but we have a tendency to keep the same type of segregated uses, as you said, suburbia, in, on Broadway and on Speedway, outrageously underutilized, perfect places for a lot of residential, two, three stories, just the perfect place, there are enough buses. But what we see is the same thing over and over again. And not only that, bad aesthetics. Mm -hmm. I'm a planner, right? I like nice aesthetics. But I can tell you there is a location on Broadway right now where a pad was created that the frontage, as you drive through, you are looking at an exit emergency right. door. Right. So we keep doing the same thing. So how would you address just thinking a little bit more, OK, these are great, potentially high transit, could hook up a lot more lines, but how do we approach changing the way we look at development on those corridors that already service? Uh, yeah, let me, let, me, let me grab a couple people. things with that. Let me grab a couple things with that. A lot of us here are probably people who love the inner city. We love the vibe of places like Fourth and Fourth. We love the vibe of the historic city and so on. But, and you know, for a lot of us, those big long corridors going out to the east sort of aren't really the places we would hang out all that much. But the, it's very important to understand that a lot of people who are in the income, the ranges of that income spectrum where transit can be transformative to them are living in those landscapes. This is called the suburbanization of poverty. And, um, there's an enormous challenge of providing the, the opportunities for people to live closer in. But meanwhile, we have to think about those streets realistically. And I'm glad you framed the question in terms of aesthetics. Because you know, my, my architect friends look at a street like Broadway or Speedway, and they tell you, you know, there's a thing called the sprawl repair manual that you can get, right? And it will tell you, OK, you see, you take this strip mall, and you, um, and you put like townhouses and a little bit of, of apartment tower over here, organize the retail like that. Um, but long before you were going to do that, um, uh, well, there, there are a couple of, but I mean, the sprawl power manual will also tell you that when you have large, low density lots with big mansions on them, you should just build a row of townhouses in each backyard. 
So there's some things in it that are not all that practical, in my opinion, in my experience. But it is true that, there, but let's look at a street like Speedway or out of Broadway. Let's look at that classic suburban sprawl boulevard and notice what does work. What does work is that there's a rhythm to it. There's a major intersection every half mile, maybe, something like that. That's also a really good rhythm for rapid transit, to stop about that often or ideally a little more. But there, and existing commercial tends to be clustered around those nodes, around the big intersections, which are also the grid transfer points. You actually have a very good geography for rapid transit there. The pedestrian environment is appalling. <laughs> but, Pedestrian, fixing the pedestrian environment is a way easier problem than fixing the urban structure. It's way more super, it's frosting compared to the urban structure, and the urban structure is very favorable. The urban structure is that you've got these easily redevelopable commercial parcels on the four corners fronting right where you're gonna have a station, okay? You're not gonna have to redevelop very much residential. You can do it almost all by redeveloping the commercial parcels, which are easier to redevelop because there's nobody, because nobody lives there and commercial, commercial owners are much willing, more willing to sell at the right price. And so that's actually a remarkably easy problem in the scheme of things. And, um, but you, and obviously you do need to have your zoning uh, and land use uh, controls brought into conformance with and valuing frequent transit the way we have in Portland. So for example, in Portland, if you're gonna build a three-story building and you build it on a frequent transit line, will require less parking, in some cases almost no parking. That will make the building cheaper, that will make the building more affordable. Okay, that's how that works. So, um, so the frequent network, and, and then the frequent network starts driving development. One of the ways it starts driving development is through city interventions on things like lowering the parking ratios. Some cases eliminate them. Sometimes we have parking maximums. You can't build more parking than this. Um, and certainly we permit something that is, des that is identified as affordable housing that is meant to be affordable with very low parking ratios because we expect and want low, we, you know, the whole point is that we're giving low income people an opportunity to spend their money on something other than cars, right? That's the whole point of that. So, um, so that all, that all the, and there's a lot of, I mean, in, in the planning, uh, you, know, you, you can, you know, you, I can introduce you to Portland city planners and we talk about the specific ways that that's done, but we've had a lot of success with it. Um, and that's, and you know, that's really how it begins. But I do want you to be aware that that ugly suburban arterial can evolve. But another important thing about it is it can eventually evolve to sort of beautiful new urbanist townhouses over retail at each one of those corners. But the most important thing is we've got to provide a safe and humane environment for the people who are already out there having to live out there and needing to get to transit. And that's why this idea of, uh, one of the things I advocate is on those boulevards, a safe place to cross the street every quarter mile. A safe place to cross the street every quarter mile, which is about the ideal spacing for local bus stop service. And because one of the things I'm constantly telling transit agencies is, you know, there's nowhere to cross the street for half a mile here, but you've put a bus stop here and an opposing bus stop over there, but you can't make a round trip unless you can get to the stops on both sides of the street, right? You're gonna leave from here and arrive back there. What is this? What is this accomplishing? If you can't cross the street safely, it's not really a bus stop. So I want to say, I drove out Speedway last night. My, it went on and on and on. Um, <laughs> but I did finally get to the mountains uh, for an evening hike. And I have to say, I'm really impressed with how many crosswalks there are on Speedway. It really jumped out at me. As, and that's an interesting example, because it's not beautiful, but it's functional. And for a lot of people, functional makes all the difference. Functional and safe makes all the difference. So, um, you know, the aesthetics are great. I want things to be beautiful, but even more than that, I want things to be functional because I see how overwhelmingly people respond to something that is just functional and safe. And those speedway crosswalks are a nice example. Yeah. 
What are elements of uh, successful funding strategies that you've seen, you know, throughout the nation, maybe even in Portland? Yeah. Um, transit is being funded a lot of different ways. And there's a lot of, and, and one of the most interesting debates right now is at which level of government the funding should be. Should there be, you know, an Arizona statewide transit source like California has that goes out to every county whether they want it or not? Should there be a, um, um, you know, what kinds of, of sources should the, should the funding come from? I think that we are working, uh, um, but here's a couple interesting things that are happening. And let me start by giving you my simplest answer to the question of who pays. The answer to the question of who pays is who cares. <laughs> Fundamentally, the support for, the, the, the financial support for service is going to have to come from whoever cares about it and from whichever level of government cares about it. That's why one of the things that's happening in the business and in the, in, in the industry that's very interesting now is that the familiar giant regional transit agency that we know from a lot of big cities is starting to hit a crisis in many different places. And the crisis it's hitting is manifested every time you take a region-wide vote on transit. And what you get back is a density map. What you get back is a map of residential density. And it's really obvious that the core city has an absolutely urgent commitment to transit, sees transit as an existential need, and that's completely understandable if you live in the core city. Just as it's completely understandable if you live 15 miles east of here, it doesn't seem like that to you. It is completely understandable that everybody is voting based on their own experience and based on you know, the relevance it seems to have to them. You can't expect people to do anything else. So the interesting question that's coming down the line is, Maybe, although transit needs to be regionally coordinated, maybe the arrangement you have now here where a lot of control lies with the city of Tucson is actually a pretty good arrangement. And maybe also we need more tools for voters over the small area where they really care and where they will really benefit. This is how you did the streetcar after all. Voters over the small area where they really care and they really benefit being allowed to vote on something and make it happen and tax themselves to do it. Now, one of the odd things that confuses me is that in a number of red states, um, conservatives who claim to want smaller government tend to not to want to give local government the power to do things. They tend to want to keep it. At <laughs> and I, that doesn't strike me as a conservative idea at all. That doesn't make any sense to me in the context of what I thought conservatism was. But I think that's an important fight. There are several crisis, crisis signs of situations happening around right now. There's an extraordinary drama playing out in Seattle where an incredibly transit-dependent city, very much like San Francisco, surrounded by a whole lot of, of suburbia which cares about transit a lot less, is in the minority in its big regional county where these decisions are made, routinely gets outvoted, routinely gets underserved, routinely gets talked down to and patronized, and yet, the only reason there's any transit in the county at all is that any time there's a county-wide measure, Seattle votes overwhelmingly yes, and gets the whole regional measure over the line. And Seattle is starting to say, you know, we're kind of tired of this. And so, and, and you're up against a lot, and, and we really need to start being able to do what we need to do for ourselves, use it, you know, with the support of, the voter, of our voters who actually support this. So I don't know where that's going, but I do think this idea that it all has to be controlled up there, that it, or even the idea that it has to be regional, uh, is becoming more, and is I think inevitably going to, going to be challenged. We are heading into an era of municipal renaissance. We are heading, uh, pick up a wonderful book by the sociologist Benjamin Barber called If Mayors Ruled the World. <laughs> the subtitle he wanted is Why They Should and How They Already Do. Um, and he is talking about a future in which cities are so fundamental to how the global economy works that cities have to be able to govern themselves. 
and have to be able to control those levers with their own voters. That's the, that's the strongest opinion I have about that. We actually have uh, two very specific examples in this city uh, that, uh, that illustrate this uh, tension between the region and the city. Uh, uh, several years ago, the city of Tucson approved a, a widening of the Grant Road corridor, uh, increasing the, ca the car lane capacity by 40%, when traffic counts in the last uh, 10 years have showed uh, a decline in traffic counts, some, somewhat uh, corresponded to your BMT inflection point. Um, so we're getting 20% reduced uh, traffic counts in a corridor where we're expanding by 40%. Mm -hmm. We live in an era where, you know, despite your wrapper uh, analogy, um, we can't do the, the other modes because there's no resources left after mm -hmm. we're uh, ex excessively expanding our roadways. Right now, and I want to ask you what you would tell our local officials, because that's really where the rubber hits the road. Uh, many of us in this room are tra transit activists. Mm -hmm. There's very few elected officials here today. And uh, we've heard the best practices. We've heard these lectures for the last 10 years, but we're not getting anything done. Right now, we've got a major corridor project uh, second only to the Grant Road one, where the, the, the regional plan was to uh, enlarge in a four-lane road to eight lanes, where there is no rationality to, to do such a thing. And uh, that, if we do that, that will preclude uh, investment in the kinds of uh, modes of mobility that will make our uh, community resilient going forward. So what are you going to uh, leave this town with in terms of a message to <laughs> elected officials um, to, to make a difference. Because we don't see a difference being made. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are wasting precious resources. We're not even looking at uh, where the oil market is going in the next uh, 10 and 20 years, which is going to make what you've illustrated even more pronounced because we, we simply as a civilization are not going to be able to afford a car-based transportation system. So please give me, give me your, your best uh, advice to elected officials so that you can help us, the activists, who have been trying to change the picture in this community for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I... Let's, let, let me start by, by forgiving ourselves for why this is hard. Let's forgive ourselves for why this has been hard. This has been hard because um, the, the car, we have been designing cities for the car for so long that the car seems so understandably for most people in most of their situations and most of the places where they live the car seems inseparable from liberty, um, from, from the sensation of liberty for themselves, not to mention opportunity. Um, and, and, and so people, so it is understandable that people feel, um, you know, that, 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 that people feel that strong attachment and there's that expectation. I think that what I say to elected officials about this is, first of all, let's be aware that let's push back against the, 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 the professional manuals. Let's push back against, the, let's notice the way that a lot of the case for why you know, Broadway has to be eight lanes or whatever comes out of methodologies that assume that the future is like the past. And then show them the VMT inflection chart. The future is not like the past. The future is not like the past. If you are planning for the past, if you are even planning for the present, you are failing to plan for the future. And that is economically ruinous. Make the conservative argument, which is that highway widening is bad for the economy because ultimately it is preventing the emergence of the kind of city that will make valuable economic drivers want to locate here. That's really the fundamental. 
Make the conservative argument. I want to ask about, um, particularly on Broadway, so the community is in a um, very involved planning process and um, looking at a variety of uh, transit options um, we're hopeful for. Um, and, and part of the, the uh, some of the ideas that we're talking about are, and, and my question is about how, how soon can we jump to some of those things or is it better to uh, piecemeal it along? So uh, bus rapid transit is an option uh, down the road, some, some rail thing if that's warranted. But, it, but um, there's some talk of you know, just kind of um, maybe improving bus stops and some piecemeal improvements and then growing into bus rapid transit. Do you see that as successful or do you see it better to commit that dedicated space um, right out the gate? I certainly think that if you have space that is in danger of disappearing, that you might need, that it's certainly appropriate. There's a, there's a very preliminary kind of planning that is, a, that is called future-proofing, which is basically, it's done in all kinds of things. It basically means make the case for hanging onto the land. Make the case for not foreclosing the opportunity by building something else. Um, and you certainly need to do that. Let me take that back to a somewhat higher level, which is what should we do next? We have a COA, whatever that is, Comprehensive Operational Analysis, that stands for. Um, I know what that means, but um, I, could, I could give you a long lecture about why I'm suspicious about every, all three of those words. But um, you have a COA, which is a bunch of well-intentioned, but very sort of low-level, uh, technocratic kind of recommendations for moving some routes around and also for reducing the budget, because that was apparently considered a constraint. My understanding is that it actually shrinks this map, by the way. It actually makes some of this go away. That's not good. Uh, that's not good because this is, this is the next step. This is the layer below the BRT. This is the layer that will make the BRT succeed in the same way that our urban bus grid made our light rail line succeed in Portland. Um, how to get it all organized, it seems to me like it's time for a kind of for the city to do a transit visioning exercise. But, when I, but I wish there were a better word than visioning because visioning makes people think of getting around tables with flip charts and talking about their feelings. <laughs> and um, it's how to be a little more than that. Um, so in, if you haven't read my book, I, my book begins with a simple analogy of a plumber. Say you hire a man to fix your plumbing. He goes in under your sink, he does, makes some noise, does some things. And then he beckons you over and he says, look, look, I could, um, I could just tape all that together like that and it would work for another couple of years. Or I could rip the whole assembly out and replace it and get a new doohickey like this, 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 and that would cost like $700, but that would be good as new. And he's asking you of, uh, uh, what you want. Here's the thing. The plumber is the transit planner, the transit consultant like me. The customer is you through your city council, right? Visioning, that, visioning for transit that actually has an effect has to answer the question that arises in transit planning. If you just get a, get a bunch of people around a table and just ask them for their transit visions, and they will get together and have an earnest conversation, and they will write up on the flip chart words like equitable, sustainable, and uh, uh, economic and prosperous, Try telling those words to your plumber in that situation. <laughs> you haven't answered his question, and therefore you have had no effect on reality. So that's my problem with a lot of vision, right? <laughs> uh, you have to answer the technical question. So one of the things that you know, I do when I'm, when I'm running these things is I say, OK, Let's get us around the table. Let's get around some tables. But instead of having you talk about your feelings, I'm going to put a map in front of you, and I'm going to give you some pipe cleaners, and I'm going to invite you to actually start laying out some routes, because I want you to have the experience that the transit planner has. I want you to have the experience of understanding how this tool works, and what it does, and what it doesn't do, right? And what trades off against what. And then people start understanding enough about what the plumber does that they can start to understand what direction they need to give him so that he can actually produce something that is what you want. And I find that that kind of process, that what this, well, I'll tell you where this leads. 
This leads to some very specific conversations, and if you read my book, Human Transit, I talk you through them, and I talk you through why certain value questions uh, repeatedly come up. One of the big ones is the trade-off between, is this transit system about maximum ridership, or is this about coverage, that is to say, a little bit of service everywhere, regardless of ridership? It is, it is one of the basic, those two things are opposites. And so one of the basic, and I, can, I explain in my book technically why they are opposites. Um, and, and, but, and so I've worked with a lot of city councils to get them, I'm working with the Edmonton City Council on this right now, to get them to the point where they're ready to say, okay, devote this percentage, of, we've, we've talked to the public about this, we've had a conversation in the media about this question, devote this percentage of our budget or this percentage of our new plan will be devoted to high ridership services. We have high standards for the ridership, for the fare box recovery, and so on. This portion of the budget is for predictably low ridership services that have non-ridership purposes, like lifeline access, response to people's needs. Generally, people, when some, generally speaking, when we're designing for ridership, we're thinking like a business, we're thinking, responding to demand, lots of people who need the service. When we're designing for coverage, we're responding to severity of needs, often among very small numbers of people. The person who stands up and tells city council how their life will be ruined if you take their bus route away, they're not defending it on ridership grounds. They're defending it on these other grounds that are also important to us. So I'm always telling transit agencies, you know, don't let your entire ridership be judged as, don't let your low ridership services be judged as failure. That's not what they're for. You know, that's not, that's not what they're trying to do. So that's the kind of question that kind of has come up. Once we have that conversation, we also then people start thinking about high frequency grids. I mean, people figure this out for themselves. I don't have to tell them. And then we start working toward a conversation that we, where the map does start to appear and get specific. But meanwhile, we've also then gotten to a shared sense, or at least a broadly understood sense that council can agree on, of what the point is and what, what we're trying to do and, where, and w where our direction is contradictory, we've tried to quantify the balance between those things so that, we can, so that we have a very clear statement of purpose. In my experience, you rush into a capital project without a very clear statement of purpose and you end up with people being confused about why we're doing it and you have, and you have different definitions of success running around and it becomes very confusing. Sorry. Uh, when you were talking about the millenniums and them having different standards than we had when we were growing up, one of the um, bullet points was the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and the New York Times came out with a, uh, a revelation that the average American will have to, in, if, if we are to be equitable in how much CO2 each person on the planet can emit, mm -hmm. Every person on the planet will have to reduce their carbon footprint by two thirds, but Americans will need to reduce their carbon footprints by nine tenths. Could you address how having a viable, um, what is the difference for people that care about the climate and use a transit system versus driving a Prius. Mm -hmm. what's, what's our footprint right. difference? Right. So uh, it's nice if you can drive a Prius. It's even nicer if you can drive these electric cars that are always being invented. Um, that's great. You're still taking up a lot of space. And this is why high ridership transit is not going to be made obsolete by Google's driverless taxi or any number of other, or personal rapid transit, or you know, really, really, really cool, or Uber, or anything else, because what high ridership transit does is use space incredibly efficiently, and the definition of a city is not much space per person. That is what a city is. <laughs> the scarcity of space is what a city is, and so, um, I think there's no question that we're having a national conversation that reflects the sort of where the average American is, and the average American is way out in the suburbs still. But the average American moves closer into the city every year. 
as our cities are now, as our inner cities are now growing, and in many cases, as so many of our suburbs are dying. I don't feel quite as much despair about how you would get to a particular climate target a few decades out, because I have a really, I'm really confident in the nonlinearity of our politics. <laughs> the nonlinearity of our politics, that is to say, um, I think that, that we are going to have a lot of inflection points where things change rapidly. And a lot of that has to do with how generational shift manifests. Suddenly, think about all the several, I'm sure you can think of several issues where just in the last decade, something that was unthinkable became routine. I can think of two of those issues, gay marriage and marijuana. Um, the absolute universal consensus 10 years ago is, is exactly the opposite of what we're all pretty sure the universal consensus will be 10 years from now. That's really not very much time for big things to change. And again, when you realize that people are acting out of their own experience, you think about the way those things change. You think about the way those things change as millennials grow up and are just having conversations at the dinner table and affect their parents' opinions. The way that, you know, I, I, think, I, think about the, I think about gay marriage in particular as an issue that happened at the dinner table, that happened very, very much in intimate conversations among friends. And I think that this, the raising of this kind of consciousness is going to happen in a similar way, which is why I will not at all be surprised if attitudes change almost as fast as they did on that issue, particularly in the, because the other reality is that the future is extremely nonlinear and the future contains big surprises. Uh, I think climate scientists will be less surprised by some of these things than the rest of us, but there are going to be some big shocks. And, and so I'm not, a, I, 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 I think transit's place is to be ready for that. Hmm. I don't feel the need to take on myself the burden of thinking how are we gonna get to that kind of footprint? Because a lot of nonlinearity in our politics is gonna work in our favor. It's the most I can offer. Well, as someone who uh, is really rather fond of her little backyard in the burbs, mm -hmm and was really happy to take the bus when she was going to school and didn't have to be at work at 4.30 and 5.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to imagine how we can have more mass transit when we have suburbs, because I don't know that I'd like to live in a very dense area. I'm rather fond of having a little room between me and my neighbors, and I was trying to imagine how that would work. Let me make Because I, I keep hearing, you know, yeah. you, need you need density, you need density. That's why there's, you know, high rises being built down near the university. It's like you have a lot of kids and you have a lot of mass transit and it drives it and makes it go and it's a success. And, and oh my gosh, I don't want to live that way. So here's part of the answer. Okay. Part of the answer is transit is not going to be equally useful everywhere. It is in the nature of transit and there's an explanation in my book about the relationship between density and transit demand. It's actually an upward curve. Double the density, you get more than double the transit demand. And I talk, I'll talk, in the book, I talk you through why you should not be surprised by that. So what that means is that to the extent that transit is focusing on ridership outcomes, as I often say to a Republican elected official who represents an outer suburban area, you want us to raise our fare box recovery so we need less subsidy? Fine. The first thing we'll do is cut all the service to your ward. <laughs> because sure enough, he represents one of the low ridership sound wall subdivision areas that are impossible to get much ridership out of because they are just too unwalkable and driving is just too easy. So what I'm saying, and so let me make another confession. I live on a 50 by 200 foot lot in Portland. I have a big backyard with an enormous garden because that's really important to me, and yet I'm standing up here pretending to be a transit advocate. How can that be? How can that can be is that I've chosen this place very carefully. The transit is useful for some purposes. It is not nearly as useful as it would be if I lived in an apartment. And I, would, and I do have sometimes have to drive, and I would really like to pay the full costs of that. I don't want my lifestyle to be subsidized. And that's 
that's, all, I think, what we need to offer to our suburban friends, our people who, want, who really like the suburban experience. We're not judging you. We're not telling you that your, your choices are wrong. We may have to ask you to, make, to, be, to pay some more of the consequences of those choices, as we all should be responsible for the consequences of our choices. Again, this is really a very conservative idea. <laughs> this is a very, you know, um, it's about, you know, let's, let's take responsibility for our choices. Let's not expect, you know. Um, um, and as long as we are not cross-subsidizing, as long as we are not overwhelmingly subsidizing one group of people over another, we're not passing judgment on people's lives. We're not saying what's a good place to live. I have tremendous respect for people who have chosen all different kinds of places to live. And I think it's very important to emphasize, because one, one of the talking points we'll, we'll get from our Republican friend, uh, some of our conservative friends, is that um, I hear this all the time, um, they're moving everyone into towers. No, Stalin moved everyone into towers. Ceausescu moved, that's the you know, um, uh, mid 20th century um, dictatorships did that. No, people are, seem to be wanting towers because when we build them, they're really expensive. So we're responding to the free market by trying to build more of them. And that's ultimately better for you who want your suburban garden. You know why? Because I don't want everybody to want what I want. If everybody wanted what I want, what I want would be a lot more expensive. <laughs> That's basic math, right? You out in the suburbs, you should love the fact that not everybody wants that, that house that you're in. Because if everybody wanted it, it would be a lot more expensive and you would not have been able to afford it. So it comes, transit, because transit is so ine inevitably specialized and succeeds in certain neighborhoods and not others, it's really an opportunity to say, hey, let's be okay about being different about what we want. Let's be okay about not all wanting the same things. That's, it's, the fact that we don't all want the same things is part of why we, can, we have a chance of affording what we want. So that's part of how that plays out. You know, I, I really, I, I don't want to imply that there's anything wrong with choosing to live on a parcel of any size, as long as you're aware that there are some costs to that and there's some opportunity, and, and you are gonna have to drive more if you live in a lower density area than if, uh, in any sort of, you know, you know, in, in, wherever we end up. It's all okay, it's okay whatever anyone wants. Hi, Dr. Walker, uh, I enjoyed seeing the uh, Melbourne uh, tram network map. That's where I'm from. Oh, right. However, I want to know if you've got some feelings on the the operation of public transit by the city and by the state as opposed to the operation of public transit by uh, for-profit organizations, um, mm -hmm. you know, public or private companies. Mm -hmm. So the arrangement you have here is an arrangement that I tend to advocate, which is that you have a private company responsible for, um, the, the bus drivers and mechanics work for a private company. The private company works for you, works for the city. Well, you know, um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a very clear role for that private management company in handling the daily operations of the system. But they operate a system that the city tells them to operate, the city controls where the routes go, the city sets the expectations for service. The city, on behalf of the voters, is still really in control of the outcome. Now, I'll tell you, and I'm not sure when you, you came back from Australia, but when I first moved to Australia in 2006, um, we were, they were at the nadir of a period in which uh, a somewhat Thatcherite, really, concept of privatization had passed through. And Margaret Thatcher's view of privatization was essentially uh, government is intrinsically incompetent. Therefore, the private sector should do everything and government should stay out of the way. If it requires a subsidy, the government should write checks to the private, to, uh, a, 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 but by and large, we should try to have as little to do with this as possible. And um, her fantasy, the fantasy was, uh, uh, that you do encounter in some British cities, but it never really emerged in Australia, is that you're going to stand at a bus stop and 
Joe's blue bus comes by and Jim's red bus goes by and you have a ticket that's good on Jim's red bus. But that's good because you as a customer are, are, are loyal to Jim's red bus as opposed to Joe's blue bus. And partly begin because Margaret Thatcher was a motorist and nobody explained to her this thing about transit. You know what? We'd really just like to take the bus that comes first. <laughs> and this was the flaw of that system. But when I got to Australia in 2006, and I was working in Sydney, which has always been the worst of the Australian cities in this way, um, you, um, there was nobody, there was practically nobody left in government who knew anything about public transport. Um, the, what happens when you set a bunch of companies to, to pretend to be competing is that they quickly, they don't have to collude. They figure out how to stay out of each other's way, and what you end up with are ter is territories, and they stay out of each other's territories. And, and competition immediately disappears, and you end up with all the same problems, but no accountability. Um, and so during the five years I was in Australia, that, uh, all, in all three of the big cities, that system has been gradually undone. And, pri and these private companies have been pushed back into, I think, their appropriate role, which is the exact role that Violi is in here which is, no, your government is the customer. The government has to have the expertise because it has to be able to, to engage with all the ways that public transport fits into all the other things that a city does. And it has to control the product because, and it represents the customer because customer choice between companies isn't how public transit works. We're going to get on the bus that comes first and that doesn't mean we're fans of Joe's Blue Bus over Jim's Red Bus. So, uh, it's been interesting watching Australia find its way back to what is basically, uh, you know, go through this craziness and find its way back to this sort of arrangement. Um, and I, but I think the arrangement is pretty good. Now, there are, of course, it's, it's still fairly revolutionary in the US because we have in a lot of other cities the, the experience of what we call the, the old huge legacy transit agency, which where the, the bus drivers and mechanics are public employees. And, um, the disadvantage of that system is that, um, uh, uh, first of all, an enormous amount of the government's, of the transit agency's time goes into resolving lawsuits about accidents, which is a very nice thing to delegate to the private sector. I really like that to happen. The other thing, quite frankly, is that um, labor, it's very difficult for a public man employee manager who works for the city council to negotiate constructively with a labor union when the labor union has access to your boss. And fundamentally, however, wherever you are on the management labor divide, there needs to be a constructive tension there. <laughs> and if there is not a constructive tension there, if it falls over one way or the other, things get really bad. So, so I'm, 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 I mean, I work for lots of legacy agencies. I, I don't, you know, uh, but, but I'm a big fan of the arrangement you have. I think as long as the city has the ability always to replace the operator or review the operator periodically, as long as the, there is constructive tension in that relationship, as long as that relationship doesn't become too cozy, which also happened in Australia a great deal. I don't know if you remember, I'll, I'll tell one more Melbourne story, which is the first time I got to Melbourne and started looking at their documents, I picked up a 2030 transit planning document and I read, Melbourne is proud of its long tradition of family-owned bus operating companies. <laughs> Which is, about as, uh, which is about as explicit as you can get that this is all basically feudalism, right? These are, these are, these are our family, you know, uh, these are like crowns passed down through a family. Anyway, welcome to America. I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> Australia is a great country, by the way. There are lots of wonderful things about it, and I hope you all get to visit. Buenas tardes. Sorry? Buenas tardes. Good evening. Good evening. First of all, I would like to appreciate your words that we should think about each other as, as equal and not low income, high income, middle income, todos igual, the same. No. I, I live in one of the last remaining barrios in, down, in downtown and um, we've never had public transportation or maybe I'll say for a, a month or so. And from then on, we haven't had it yet. And, um, it, and even our children had, had to walk under the freeway to get to their schools. So this 
conversation is interesting because then I would like to know where we're going from here. And um, when you say freedom, freedom for me, I would like to think being a native to Sonnen, born and raised, and have never left, and I don't plan to leave, having my grandchildren here. I want to remember as freedom as what made Tucson mm -hmm. and where we're at. Mm -hmm. And for me is, I hope you were shared the pictures, mm -hmm. the historical pictures. Yes. Well, yes. Tucson was made of the train mm -hmm. and the horse. I always want to remind people of the horse, regardless of people saying it's not safe, because now I believe that nowadays, nowhere and no time is safe. So being in this uniqueness of the history that we have in Tucson, I would like to share that with you and hoping that you um, recognize, admired, and notice that we have that uniqueness and that diversity here in Tucson. Absolutely. And how, how important it is to preserve that, even though with progress and, and change that we, we can integrate that, um, that blessing that we have and keep, keep what we continue having, the Shuksan in the original name of Tucson in mm -hmm. the Tohonotam language as Tucson in the Mexican. So um, I just wanna share that, that we have a very special place here. And as that native, I wanna welcome you here in Tucson and thank you for all that you have brought us. Gracias. Thank you so much. And I just, I, I think we are out of time at this point, uh, but I want to say I think that's a perfect place to end because I really am grateful for you welcoming me here that way. Um, uh, lots of people are trying to build the ideal city out in blank space without any history to work with. We have these new cities around the world. You can go visit them in China and in, 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 the, in Arabia and in many other places. And you can make them all really nice, but if there's no history, you notice that. And history is what makes a place real. And that's why, by the way, historic preservation is such an important part of how we think about our city. So let's wrap it up there. I'll, I'm just gonna stay around for a few more minutes. Happy to chat with you individually. I'm so grateful to you for you all coming out tonight. I hope this has been useful to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.